Hello everyone, welcome back to the contemporary world. Today's discussion is about the global demography. So as with all our discussions, first we must define demography. So what does demography mean? Well, demography was derived from the Greek words demos and graphia. Demos meaning population and graphia meaning writing or description. Now it was coined by Achille Gilliard a Belgian statistician in 1855. However, the origins of modern demography can be traced back to John Grant's analysis of Bills of Mortality, which was published in 1662. Now, demography refers to the study of populations uh, with reference to size and density, fertility, mortality, growth, age distribution, migration, uh, and vital statistics and the interaction of all these with social and economic conditions. As such, demography is based on vital statistics reporting and special surveys of population size and density. And in conjunction with learning about demography, we must also first define the following terms. Birth rate, life expectancy at birth, fertility rate, mortality rate, age dependency ratio, and migration. So first, birth rate, or known as uh, crude birth rate or CBR. It is an annual statistic. Measures the total number of infants born living in one calendar year. Uh, this number is divided by 1,000 to receive a smaller integer number for birth rate. Or put simply, it is the number of births per 1,000 people per year. And if you can uh, see your screen, now, uh, this is an example of uh, the CBR for Ontario in Canada. So next is the mortality rate or also called the death rate. So it is the percentage of people who die relative to the country's annual population. So, fertility rate is the total number of children born by a woman at a point of time during her childbearing years, uh, which is 15 to 45 years. Now, a number of factors can contribute to uh, the fertility rate, no? uh, especially for the urbanization of certain areas. Now, um, one of the factors, or some of the factors rather, for uh, that affect fertility are uh, the woman's age, now, female's age is the most important factor, eh, which affects fertility, uh, previous pregnancies, uh, duration of subfertility, timing and frequency of sexual intercourse, lifestyle factors, uh, weight, smoking, caffeine, etc. Family size, on the other hand, depends on the following, uh, the duration of the marriage, uh, the education of the couple, number of live births, uh, contraception method, as well as the socioeconomic status. So life expectancy is basically the expectation of life at a given age. Now it is the average number of years which a person of that age may expect to live according to mortality pattern prevalent in that country. So if you look at the graph here, it was done by the Imperial College in London and the World Health Organization. Uh, they basically predicted that the United States will trail other rich nations in life expectancy by 2030. So the average life expectancy at birth in selected uh, nations by 2030, according to their predictions, will be led by South Korea, followed by France, and third is Japan, and so on, if you can read the graph. So at uh, the current status, I believe the one with the highest life expectancy is uh, Japan, okay? So the median age is the age that divides a population into two numerically equally sized groups. Half the people are younger than this age and the other half are older. So it is a single index that summarizes the age distribution of a population. So the global median age in 1970 was 21.7 and 30 in 2019. So in between of those, if you can see the picture, in 2015, the median age of the population was 24.3 years. Next is the age dependency ratio. 
The dependency ratio is a measure of the number of dependents, age 0 to 14 and over the age of 65, compared with the total population aged 15 to 64. Now, this demographic indicator gives insight into the number of people of non-working age compared with the number of those of working age. Now, the formula for dependency ratio is the number of people aged between 0 and 14 plus the number of people aged 65 and above divided by the population between 15 and 64 times by 100. So another factor that can affect the population is basically migration. Now migration, uh, to be defined simply, is the process of movement of people from one place to another. And so with that, uh, we have immigration, which is the act of entering a foreign country, often for permanent residency, while uh, emigration is the act of leaving one's own country, often to settle permanently in another country. So now we go to the theories of population growth and decline. So there are basically uh, two theories that we will be discussing, the Malthusian theory as well as the demographic transition theory. So the Malthusian theory was popularized by Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus theorized pessimistically that the population was uncontrollable. Now this 18th century British philosopher and economist was noted for the Malthusian growth model. It was an exponential formula used to project population growth. Now his theory states that food production will not be able to keep up with growth in the human population, resulting in disease, war, famine, and calamity. Now, to some extent, some of his predictions did come true for the developing countries in the world today. That is why even after 200 years, the Malthusian theory still remains relevant. So next, we go to the demographic transition theory. Now, the theory is based on an interpretation of demographic history developed in 1929 by the American demographer Warren Thompson. Adolf Landry of France made similar observations on demographic patterns and population growth potential around 1934. In the 1940s and 50s, Frank W. Notestein developed a more formal theory of demographic transition, and by 2009, the existence of a negative correlation between fertility and industrial development had become one of the most widely accepted findings in social science. Now, this model predicts that as a country develops, high birth rates and high death rates will fall. So this model also predicts that countries will pass through periods of industrialization and urbanization on the way to reduce birth and death rates. So the demographic transition theory has five stages. Now, as we discuss the five stages, I'd like you to look at the graph as a reference not to the description of each stage. Now, as you can see, stage one is characterized by high birth rates and high fluctuating death rates, resulting in small population growth. Plagues, diseases, and poor nutrition keep mortality high. So on to stage two of the graph, you can see that the birth rate is fluctuating, death rate is slightly falling, and the total population is rising. So stage two is characterized by improved healthcare, sanitation, and increased food supplies, leading to a rapid fall in death rates. Birth rates are still high, so there is a rapid increase in population numbers. So as you can see in the graph for the third stage, now, this is characterized by a decreased growth rate of a population. Now, birth rates begin to fall and death rates are fall, have fallen dramatically. Now, industrialization and urbanization and improved living standards lead to less desire for large families. So, stage four is characterized now by the completion of the transition to a low growth rate with low birth and death rates. 
The birth rate may fluctuate in special circumstances, such as in post-war baby boom. So for stage 5, now it is characterized by a low birth than death rate. Now this is happening in some European countries and in Japan. Now it is not known if this uh, trend will extend to other regions according to the study. Uh, but for me, I guess I can safely say uh, uh, this won't extend to the neighboring regions of Japan given that there is a uh, very large difference in uh, the cultural standing of the Japanese people and the people of the surrounding regions. So now we move to the perils of overpopulation. Now the debate on the relationship between population and economic growth is as old as the study of economics. Now this has started when Thomas Malthus, as we discussed earlier, published his book, An Essay on the Principle of Population. The unfettered population growth in a country could plunge it into acute poverty. However, pessimist view has proven unfounded since developed economies in that they manage to achieve a high level of economic growth, and thus both population and the real gross domestic product GDP per capita were able to increase. So Malthus prediction was that by the middle of the 19th century, the world would inevitably exhaust the world food supply. However, Malthus' prediction was off base, but it was revived in the late 1960s when American biologist Paul R. Ehrlich and his wife Anne wrote The Population Bomb, which argued that overpopulation in the 1970s and 1980s will bring about global environmental disasters that would in turn lead to food shortage and mass starvation. Now they propose that countries like United States take the lead in the promotion of global population control in order to reduce the growth rate to zero. Now their recommendations uh, ranged from the bizarre uh, like chemical castration to a policy oriented taxing an additional child and luxury taxes on child related products to monetary incentives like uh, paying off men who would agree to be sterilized after two children to institution building a powerful department of population and environment. Now, there was some reason for this fear to persist. The rate of global population increased was at its highest between 1955 and 1975 when nations were finally able to return to normalcy after the devastation wrought by World War II. So by limiting the population, vital resources could be used for economic progress and not be diverted and wasted to feeding more mouths. Now this argument became the basis for government population control programs worldwide. In the mid-20th century, the Philippines, China, and India sought to lower birth rates on the belief that unless controlled, the free expansion of family members would lead to a crisis in resources, which in turn may result in widespread poverty, mass hunger, and political instability. So a number of these policies have been implemented worldwide to uh, quote-unquote curb the population. In the United States, Title X of the Public Health Service Act provides access to contraceptive services, supplies, and information to those in need. Now, priority for this service is given to people with low incomes. As such, uh, the family planning or the Planned Parenthood clinics are located in the low-income neighborhoods. Now, China also implemented family planning, wherein they had laws requiring birth control and abortion. They also had the one-child policy, which was regulated by the Chinese government, which spread through regional implementations. Now, the one-child policy resulted in quote-unquote illegal pregnancies, which in turn resulted into female infanticide. Now, in 2013, China approved the exemption allowing two children per families and in 2015, 
uh, completely abandoned the one-child policy. Now, in Uzbekistan, there is forced sterilization of women. Now, this is an alleged government sterilization program and there reveals a pattern of ongoing systematic forced sterilization that have affected tens of thousands of women and have intensified in recent years. Now, according to a report by the Open Society Foundations, uh, their report concluded that in Uzbekistan, all women of reproductive age who have delivered two or more children are potential targets of the program. Medical professionals are under pressure to perform the sterilizations as the authoritarian government holds doctors and nurses responsible for fulfilling quotas set by health administrators. While the international community cannot be held responsible for the forced sterilization program, its close cooperation with officials in the sphere of reproductive health and its reluctance to challenge the government's denials about forced sterilization have implicitly allowed the government to continue the practice. So as early as 1958, the American Policy Journal Foreign Affairs had already advocated contraception and sterilization as the practical solutions to global economic, social, and political problems. While there have been criticisms that challenged these arguments, it persists even to this very day. Now, in May 2009, a group of American billionaires warned of how a nightmarish explosion of people was a potentially disastrous environmental, social, and industrial threat to the world. Now, this worry is likewise at the core of the economist argument for the promotion of reproductive health. Advocates of population control contend for universal access to reproductive technologies such as condoms, pills, uh, abortion, and vasectomy, and more importantly, giving women the right to choose whether to have children or not. Now, they see these tools as crucial to their nation's development. And finally, politics determine these birth control programs. Developed countries justify their support for population control in developing countries by depicting the latter as conservative societies. These policy formulations lead to extreme policies like the forced sterilization of 20 million quote-unquote violators of the Chinese government's one-child policy. Vietnam and Mexico also conducted coercive mass sterilization. So the use of population control to prevent economic crisis has its critics. For example, Betsy Hartman disagrees with the advocates of neo-Malthusian theory and accused governments of using population control as a substitute for social justice and much needed reforms. Reforms such as land distribution, employment, uh, provisions of mass education and healthcare and emancipation. So others pointed out that population did grow fast in many countries in the 1960s. And this growth aided economic development by spurring technological and institutional innovation and increasing the supply of human ingenuity. Now they acknowledged that the shift in population from rural to the urban areas, 52% uh, to 75% in the developing world since the 1950s. Now, they likewise noted that while these megacities are now clusters in which income disparities along with transportation, housing, air pollution, and waste management are major problems, they also have become and continue to be centers of economic growth and activity. As discussed earlier, population growth has in fact spurred technological and institutional innovation and increased the supply of human ingenuity. Advances in agricultural production have shown that the Malthusian nightmare can be prevented. The Green Revolution created high-yielding varieties of rice and other cereals, and along with the development of new methods of cultivation, increased yields globally, but more particularly in the developing world. The global famine that Neo-Malthusians predicted 
did not happen. Instead, between 1950 and 1984, global grain production increased by over 250%, allowing agriculture to keep pace with population growth, thereby keeping global famine under control. Lately, a middle ground emerged between these two extremes. Scholars and policymakers agreed with neo Malthusians but suggest that if governments pursue population control programs, they must include more inclusive growth and greener economic growth. So with the discussion of population and overpopulation, it's a given that we must discuss women and their reproductive rights. Now, the reason why we must discuss women and their reproductive rights is simply because the character in the middle of these debates are women. Now, they are often the subject of these population measures. So, reproductive rights supporters argue that if population control and economic development were to reach their goals, women must have control over whether they will have children or not and when they will have their children, if any. So by giving women these power, they will be able to pursue their vocations, be they economic, social, or political, and contribute to economic growth. This serial correlation between fertility and family and fortune has motivated countries with growing economies to introduce or strengthen their reproductive health laws, including abortion. So high-income first world nations and fast developing countries were able to sustain growth in part because women were given the power of choice and easy access to reproductive technologies. In North America and Europe, 73% of governments allow abortion upon a mother's request. Moreover, the more educated a woman is, the better are her prospects of improving her economic position. Women can spend most of the time pursuing either their higher education or their careers instead of forcibly reducing this time to take care of their children. So most countries implement reproductive health laws because they worry about the health of the mother. In 1960, Bolivia's average total fertility rate was 6.7 children. In 1978, the Bolivian government put into effect a family planning program that included the legalization of abortion. After noticing a spike in unsafe abortion and maternal deaths. In 1985, uh, the total fertility rate went down to 5.13 and further declined to 3.46 in 2008. So a similar pattern occurred in Ghana after the government expanded reproductive health laws out of the same concern as that of the Bolivian government. So as a result, fertility declined steeply and continued to decline after 1994. So such examples seem to draw the attention of other countries. Thus, in 2014, the United Nations report noted that the proportion of countries allowing abortions to preserve the physical health of a woman increased from 63% to 67%, and those to preserve the mental health of the woman increased from 52% to 64%. Opponents regard reproductive rights as nothing but a false front for abortion. Now, they contend that this method of preventing conception endangers the life of the mother and must be banned. The religious wing of anti-reproductive rights flank goes further and describe abortion as a debauchery that sullies the name of God. It will send the mother to hell and prevent a new soul, or the baby soul, to become human. So this position was a politically powerful one, partly because various parts of the developing world remain very conservative. Unfailing pressure by Christian groups compelled the group governments of Poland, Croatia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and even Russia 
to impose restrictive reproductive health programs, including making access to condoms and other technologies difficult. Muslim countries do not condone abortion and limit wives to domestic chores and delivering babies. The Philippines, with a Catholic majority, now has a reproductive health law in place, but conservative politicians have enfeebled it through budget cuts and stalled its implementation by filing a case against the law in the Supreme Court. A country being industrialized and developed does not automatically assure pro-women reproductive regulations. Now, in the United States, the women's movement of the 1960s was responsible for the passage and judicial endorsement of a pro-choice law, but conservatives controlling state legislatures have also slowly undermined this law by imposing a restriction on women's access to abortion. So while pro-choice advocates argue that abortion is necessary to protect the health of the mother, their conservative rivals shift the focus on the death of the fetus in the mother's womb as the reason for reversing the law. So this battle continues to be played out in all the political arenas in the United States. Now, from a feminist perspective, feminists approach the issue of reproductive rights from another angle. They are foremost against any form of population control because they are compulsory by nature, resorting to a carrot-and-stick approach that actually does not empower women. So they believe that the government assumptions that poverty and environmental degradation are caused by overpopulation are wrong. So these factors ignore other equally important causes like unequal distribution of wealth, the lack of public safety nets, like universal health care, education, and gender equality programs. Feminists also point out that there is very little evidence that point to overpopulation as the culprit behind poverty and ecological devastation. Today's population has reached 7.9 billion and it is estimated to increase to 9.5 billion in 2050 then 11.2 billion by 2100. So the median age of this population is 30.1 with the male median age at 29.4 and the female 30.9 years. So 95% of this population growth will happen in the developing countries with demographers predicting that by the middle of this century, Several countries will have tripled their population. The opposite is happening in the developed world where populations remain steady in general, but declining in some of the most advanced countries like Japan and Singapore. However, this scenario is not a runoff that could get out of control. Demographers predict that the world population will stabilize by 2050 to 9 billion, although they warn that feeding this population will become an immense challenge. The decline in fertility and the existence of a young productive population, however, may not be enough to offset this concern over food security. So the Food and Agricultural Organization warns that in order for countries to mitigate the impact of population growth, food production must increase by 70%. The FAO or the Food and Agricultural Organization recommends that countries increase their investment in agriculture, craft long-term policies aimed at fighting poverty, and invest in research and development. The UN body also suggests that countries develop a comprehensive social service program that includes food assistance, consistent delivery of health services, and education, especially for the poor. If domestic production is not enough, it becomes essential for nations to import. The FAO therefore enjoins governments to keep their markets open and to eventually 
move towards a global trading system that is fair and competitive and that contributes to a dependable market for food. So in conclusion, demography is a complex discipline that requires the integration of various social scientific data. So as you have seen, demographic changes and policies have impacts on the environment, politics, resources, and others. Yet at its core, demography accounts for the growth and decline of human species. It may be about large numbers and massive effects, but it is ultimately about the people. Thus, no interdisciplinary account of globalization is complete without an accounting of people. So the next lesson, uh, we will continue on this theme of examining people and we will focus particularly on their global movement. So that ends our discussion on global demography. I will see you on the next lesson. Bye!